Hi, everybody. And we're going to start uh, talking about Google Maps. Anyone have any questions or anything before we start? OK, I will take that as a no. So let's take a look at what we're going to be doing, what we're talking about for Google Maps. To set up using a map on your Android device and be able to control it, have the user pick things from it, put markers and all that fun stuff, um, there's a few little things you need to worry about. Uh, there's this thing called the Google Maps API, and this is going to be the API we use on Android to talk to the map. But then there's also a server side API that's going to provide the actual map resources, things like the tiles that you're going to be seeing on the screen. In order to use that, we need to get a key for that. And that's, that's called a, uh, an API key that you'll get from the Google Developer Console. And we're going to put that, uh, we're going to put that inside your our key, the key code for that inside your application so we can actually reference it. On the server side, if you just create this key, it's wide open for anything to use. And so we really want to restrict that a little bit more. So what we're going to do is take a look at the SHA-1 signing key for your application and the application ID itself and put that information in with the key. And that'll make sure that it's only being able to be used by that particular key there. Um, note that uh, the Compose support, Jetpack Compose support for Google Maps is pretty new. It's only a couple months old um, and it's experimental. And what that means is that it's pretty likely that it could change over time. So keep that in mind when you're going through this example. You know, as that stabilizes, I'll be creating some new videos for it. So Let's move on a little bit here, and then we'll go ahead and do all these steps. The general setup you're going to need is we're going to create an empty Compose project, get that key, and then we're going to put the key into our local.properties file. The local.properties file isn't checked in to your repo, so it's something that's just going to exist for you. And anytime somebody wants to take this project, check it out, and actually try it, they're going to need to create a key and put it in their local.properties file. Um, in order for this to work, we're going to use a plugin called the Map Secrets Gradle plugin. And the Map Secrets Gradle plugin is one that's going to fetch that key, be able to put it inside of the, the manifest appropriately so that you can, you can use this to, to fetch your map data. So the last part on this is the manifest. This is where we're actually specifying the key for the application to use it. And you reference the key by using dollar sign maps API key, that'll pull it from that local.properties file. And this way, when you check things in, you don't have this key actually hard coded in for people to go ahead and use in their own applications if they want to try. In order to get the SHA-1 for your, your application, this is basically a fingerprint that describes your application's signing signature. Uh, the um, or the signing certificate. Uh, what we need to do is run the Gradle W signing report on your application, and it'll actually tell you for the debug configuration what key it is. And that's what we're going to use for debugging. When you're actually doing a production one, you're going to want to take a look at whatever certificate you're using for production. We'll go to that console, googlesdeveloper.com. Uh, consoledevelopersgoogle.com and in the dashboard there we're going to first of all need to say that we want to use the maps sdk for your uh, id you're going to need an id to sign in by the way <clears throat> and then we're going to create credentials based on that that restrict it to that api and restrict it to your application after you have your key we need to ask permissions. And we're going to need to talk a little bit about permissions in here and how this works. Um, there's a couple places you need to specify permissions. Inside your manifest, you're going to add in these users permissions tags that'll tell which permissions that your application wants to use. Some of these permissions are considered dangerous permissions. Some are considered normal permissions. Some are considered signature permissions or system permissions. System permissions are supposed to be uh, restricted to just the Android SDK itself. Anything that's considered a dangerous permission is one that might expose some kind of user's personally identifiable information or PII. Uh, location is a good example of that. Where the user currently is is a sensitive piece of information, so it's a dangerous permission. Any type of dangerous permissions need to be double checked at runtime with the user. So when you double check at runtime, it's going to pop up a little dialogue that looks like this for location to ask 
hey, user, do you want a precise location? Do you want an approximate location? Depending on the application that they're doing. For the car finder application we're going to be developing, we're going to need precise information. If they say proximate, it's really not going to be super useful unless they're trying to say, well, within this 10 block radius, here's where your car is parked. Um, you must handle both of those permissions. The user can actually say either one of these. You're going to need to include them both, and the user is going to choose one. Once you know which one's selected, you could put a message up to the user saying, hey, please, user, go and fix this. Uh, for this application, approximate isn't going to be terribly useful. And then they'd have to actually go back to the settings to fix that. Um, the user can also decline permissions. If the user says, no, I don't want to allow this application to use location permissions, then your application has to decide how to handle that. If location is a key service or a key part of your application, you really can't do much. And so you're going to have to just put up a message to the user saying, I'm sorry, this application is useless without location. We're just going to go ahead and quit. Please go and change the permission if you want to use the application. Um, for a car finder, if that is the core functionality of the application, that's going to be the case. You're going to want to say, sorry, user, you can't use the application. For other applications, the uh, location might be optional. Think about a camera. In a camera application, you can save the actual location information in the image as part of its EXIF information. That isn't a necessary feature. It's really an optional feature. So if the user says, no, I don't want to allow per location, you can go ahead and uh, disable that part of the functionality and then let them use everything else. So they can take pictures as normal. It just won't have the location information. <clears throat> so our Car Finder X application is going to look something kind of like this. We're going to have our map and we have a couple little icons on the top here. The star icon will save your current location as where the car is. So as soon as you get out of the car, you tap that and it remembers where your car is. Then you go and walk to wherever you're interested in going, you know, restaurant, a movie theater, whatever. And on the way back, when you open up the application, you'll hit the little uh, walk icon here. And the walk icon will take your location and send it over to the normal Google Maps application with your current location and your well, your current location over here and your, your target location. So you'll know where to walk to get to your car. And then the trash can will just delete that. So let's take a look at creating an application here. <clears throat> now, the, uh, the application I've created here, I just created a empty composed application to start with. There's nothing else in here. It's just the normal hello world. And uh, what we're going to do is set this thing up so that it can have the map support. So let's see what we're going to need. Uh, the one thing that uh, we're going to need to do a little bit differently for this is in order to make this work, we need a slightly newer version of Jetpack Compose. And so we're going to tweak that inside of our project definition. I'm going to go to Compose Maps, Gradle Properties, uh, not uh, Build Deck Gradle. And then in here, I'm going to change this one to 1.2.0 dash RC03, which is the, the latest version of 1.2.0. Now we also need to specify which compiler to use for this. And that's the compiler compose version. And that's just 1.2.0. These settings down here, the one that we need to worry about is our version of Kotlin, because we're still tied to a specific version of Kotlin for a specific version of compose. So this one's going to be 1.7. And we also need one other plugin. I'm going to copy over here. This is the secrets plugin. And this secrets plugin right now is version 2.0.1. And this is just defining it so that we can use it on the, uh, the applications build.gradle. So those are the three things we need to do at the level of the, uh, the, the root of the project. So I'm going to go into the app directory up here and go to his build.gradle. And we're going to make a few little tweaks in this guy as well. So I'm going to copy in the uh, secrets plugin one here. And there he is. And then I'm going to need to bring in some dependencies. I'm going to clean up a few of these first. Make him to 1.8.25.15. And let's bring in some other dependencies that we're going to need here. See if I can grab the right ones. Uh, I'm not going to need those yet. Let me come to these ones first. 
So here's our first batch of dependencies. There's the basic map support. This is bringing in the Google map. And on top of that, we have some support for Jetpack Compose that uses those maps. So he's gonna bring in the normal map view and wrap it up into a composable function so we can use it inside Compose. Then we have some extra utils we may be needing and Kotlin support for maps. So now that we have those, I believe, oh, uh, we can go ahead and say sync on this. Let's give it a try and see how it goes. Okay, so, so far so good. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and get our API key. Bring up a Google Developer Console. If I just search for that, it should be able to find it. And here's the Google Developers Console. We can go in. You're going to need to have your own account to get into here. So you're going to have to sign up for a Google account. And we're going to go to Credentials underneath here. Actually, first of all, we need to go Enabled APIs and Services. So under Enabled APIs and Services, we can go to this little plus here that says Enable APIs and Services. And we're gonna to wanna to enable the Maps SDK for Android. So you can just search for that by just saying Maps, and then Android should find it if it's not showing up. And we can go into there, and right now I have it enabled. We can go to Manage, and here, actually I do not wanna enable billing. Uh, let's see, where was the, there's probably a, uh, I, I enabled this and I'm not sure how to disable it. Um, there's probably going to be a button over here that says enable. You can go ahead and hit, if not go to manage and it should say enable. Um, I don't want to actually enable the pricing on this one. If you have trouble with it, let me know. Uh, but you should be able to just enable it. And I just don't want any keys to be used to, to charge billing to me. They give you a certain amount of free use of the APIs, uh, but then after that, you have to end up paying per uh, thousand uses or something like that. Okay, so we'll come back out of here. Once you have that enabled, <coughs> we can go to credentials and I'm gonna delete the credential that I created earlier. We're going to want to create an API key. And why is he not deleting? There we go. And we're going to create a new API key. So we come up to create credentials, API key. And this will create a brand new key. And it's going to take a little bit to, to set up. It might be like five minutes to 10 minutes. Um, hopefully that won't be a problem there. But we're creating that key. And note that it says it's unrestricted. So this key could be used for any application to do any type of billing. This is why you really, really want to lock it down to your specific application. So I'm going to go ahead and say close and click on that key. And it's going to give me some details. So first of all, I want to restrict this to Android applications. So that's going to give you some, some pretty uh, tight uh, restriction there. I'm also going to restrict it to certain APIs. So I'm going to come down here and say, Maps SDK for Android. So it can only be used for Maps SDK for specific apps. Now, right now, it's not locking down to any given apps. So we need to find that SHA-1 signing certificate and restrict it. So I'm going to go back over here and under the terminal, say Gradle W signing report. Oops. There we go. So now we'll see that the keys that it's showing us, we have this debug key and here's the SHA-1. So I can just go ahead and copy it. And then if I go back over to my keys, I can say add an item, paste in the SHA-1. And now I need to, to set up the uh, Android uh, package, the package ID on this guy. 
So if I come back over and take a look in my build.gradle at the app level, we'll see that we have this application ID specified when we created the application. So I'm just going to copy that application ID and paste it in there and say done. So now I've associated that specific package with that specific ID. Now just a note on how we're going to grade this. I used to go in and add in all the specific uh, application IDs for every single user, and that was a major hassle. So when I'm testing this, I won't have any restrictions on this uh, just for the test, and then I delete my key. So there's you know not much chance of it getting out there. Um, for your own key, make sure you lock this in because once you've published your com Java Dude compose maps with this key as the signing certificate, you know, whatever signing certificate you're using to, sign, to, to send it in, that's locked down. It'll be associated with your account, with that ID, and that SHA-1. Um, if you lose that signing certificate, you won't ever be able to update it. So make sure you don't lose your signing certificate. And then the users wouldn't have any updatability on the application. We'll talk more about that when we talk about publishing. Uh, but this locks it down so that once it's in the store, nobody else can create an application with that ID and that certificate. So don't let anybody have your certificates. Uh, so we got him uh, locked down there. I'm going to go ahead and save. And that'll probably take a few minutes to do its thing. What I want to do is copy the SHA-1 of this key. So I'm going to, it's actually not a SHA-1, it's just the, the key identifier. I'm going to copy him. That's the one that we're going to need to put inside of our local.properties file. So I'm going to add inside here maps API key equals, and then paste that guy. So that's going to be where our, our key is defined. Now this local.properties does not get checked in into your repo. So you're going to have to enter that anytime somebody is you know, checking your project out. Uh, and that supports it so that different users can have different keys that they're testing against. Now once we've got him set up, we need to go to our app source main Android manifest.xml. And inside here, we're going to have to put in the API key. And I'm just going to copy that from my little prep project over here. And it has to go underneath the application tag. So it's going to be metadata for the API key. I'm going to actually come back over and copy that key again because I used copy paste to paste that code in. And Actually, no, I don't need to because I already put the key in. So now I have Maps API key referencing the Maps API key in local properties. And so that should allow, whoops, I went to the wrong file. That should allow us to access the data. So we'll actually be able to get maps on the screen. So inside of the manifest, we also need to declare some permissions. The first permission that we're going to need, I'm going to say uses permission. I'm going to pick internet. That's going to allow me to fetch data off a network connection. So not just the internet at large, that could be for any type of local access as well. Anytime you're using TCP IP, you need to have that internet permission. Now the internet permission is not a dangerous permission. So it's one because it doesn't expose user uh, PII directly. Uh, in order to use this, uh, this one, we don't need to do a runtime permission check on this only inside the manifest. So that's marked there. Now, we'll add in the other ones a little later when we're actually trying to, to use the location API to get things. So that's good, that's good. What is he unhappy about here? Redundant label can be removed, okay. I love it when the, the template projects have issues. So we'll just delete that. No more redundant label. Now let's go to our main activity and see if we can do something to add a map into this guy. And first thing we want to do is let's create some uh, locations that we want to display uh, a, a, a map marker at. I'm going to copy that information over here. So I looked up where Google headquarters is or pretty close to it, and put in a lat long for it. 
This is going to be latitude and longitude combination, where the latitude is the first one, longitude is the second. And this is going to represent where we actually want to look for uh, uh, putting a point on the map. I'm going to use this default camera position to actually set up the initial spot that we're going to uh, pan over to on the map. <clears throat> I'm going to delete some of this extra stuff at the bottom here just so we get that out of the way. And what we're going to do inside here, some of this is actually from the, uh, the maps example. Uh, that's uh, on the GitHub page for the, the Google Maps. Um, I've done some tweaking to it to make it a little simpler in some places and a little more robust in a few places. So the first thing that we're going to want to do is keep track of if our map has been loaded or not. And what this example did is they put a little spinner on the screen while the map's loading. And so as long as it's loading, the spinner will stay up and then the map will show up. That way you don't just get a blank screen while the map data is, is loading in. So to do this, I'm going to set up some state inside of this composable that tells us if the map has been loaded yet. So I'm going to say var map loaded by remember, and then we'll say mutable state of, whoops, not set, state of false. So we'll just say that he's not currently loaded. Now what remember does is it puts a little uh, holder inside of the table, the, the what they call the slot table for Jetpack Compose. Think of it as the tree that uh, we're uh, emitting information to before we actually render it on the screen. So this little remember slot is going to keep track of some data for us. We're putting in a bucket that we can change, that's the mutable state of, from false to true and so on. Because it's a piece of state inside Jetpack Compose, anywhere else we reference this is going to be able to observe to see when it changes. And when it changes, then it'll recompose itself. So I'm going to import the remember. And now we're getting this little squiggly line here because the delegation is looking for a getter or a setter for this object, and we don't have one. So we need to actually import it. All we need to do here is alt enter, and then we can say import get value of mutable state of. And then we're gonna to need to do it again because it's mutable for the set value. And boom, so now we're keeping track of that guy there. And what we're gonna do is also have a little camera position Actually, do I need this one for this example? Yeah, I should actually do it. We're going to use it a little bit later on. I'm going to create a camera position state equals, remember, camera position state. And inside there, we can just say position equals default camera position. So what this is going to do is, again, create another little holder inside of the slot table for Compose to keep track of some data, and we're going to put this in there. Now, we're not passing anything in to these parens, so there's no argument being passed in as a key. So this is only going to be evaluated once. So we're going to set the position once, hold on to it, and then if we're recomposed, we're never going to do this again. We're just going to keep reusing the old one. And... So this is going to be our initial camera position state. And now we want to just put our little user interface on the screen. I'm going to represent the screen as a box to start with. It's just a very simple little area to put stuff in. And I can say fill max size. That should be cool. And we're going to have two things in this. This allows them to overlap on top of each other. The last thing specified in the box is topmost. So what we're going to do is put in our little Google map section. And then if we're not yet loaded, we're going to put a spinner on top of it. So we will say Google map view. And I'm just going to keep him kind of empty for the moment because we actually haven't defined him yet. And then we're going to say if not map loaded, then we're going to do an animated visibility. So the animated visibility is going to allow this to kind of fade in and fade out. And we're going to say visible is not, is map loaded. Or not map loaded. There we go. And inside there, we're going to have a circular progress indicator. And we can put a modifier on him. 
let's make his background be material theme dot colors dot background so we're just whatever the theme that's defined for this application we're going to use the general background color and that's going to end up basically blanking the screen with the spinner in front and then we can say wrap content size oh actually it's for wrapping content size it's only going to have a background around the actual size needed so that's going to be our little progress indicator we need to do a couple things on the animated visibility in order to actually make it do its cool stuff so we're going to say modifier equals modifier dot fill max size. So it's just going to take up as much space as it needs, or as it can for the entire screen area there. And when it's going to happen, we're going to have an enter transition of none. So it'll just immediately appear. And if it's going to exit, we're going to say it's going to be a fade out. So when it's ready to actually go away, you'll see that fade out. It'll, it's going to start immediately without any type of fade in, but then it'll exit. Okay, so this is basically our nice little spinner here. Let's create our Google map view to start with here. So at composable, fun Google map view and let's just for the moment say text and yeah, we'll do this so we'll say text text equals map goes here and we're going to need to have a, a callback to tell us when the maps actually loaded so I'm going to say on map loaded it's going to be a unit and inside here I'm going to kick off a launched effect to just delay a couple seconds so we can see the spinner come up there so we'll have launched effect and I only want this to run once I never want it to cancel and start again so I'm just going to pass in unit you can pass in anything static like unit or, or false or true you know whichever one a lot of times people use true there and then inside here I'm just going to say delay for three seconds and then call on map loaded just kind of like that and that should allow us to tweak that variable to display the uh, to get rid of the uh, the spinner so inside here we'll say on map loaded is just going to be map loaded equals true like that and that should switch over to our, our uh, actual map being shown there so let's try running this and see how that looks. And could not resolve. Oh, why did I forget the compiler? Ah, I know which I forgot. Let me go find where that was. So I need to explicitly tell the compose uh, compiler which version it should be using. So underneath app build.gradle, there's this compose options block that says use the normal compose version. We actually want to use that variable I defined for compo from compiler compose version. So I'm just going to update that. And now we should be in good shape with that. Let's sync it. Uh, unknown property compose compiler version. Oh, I think I said compiler compose version before. Let's come back to the top. I did. That was silly. And now let's try it. Okay, excellent. Let's try running it. And there's our spinner going. It should go for three seconds. And then poof, the map appears. So assuming that the Google map itself is going to tell us when it's ready, we can use this same logic to actually display the map. So let's go ahead and fix that up. So our Google map is not really doing anything super interesting yet. Uh, and where did I go? There he is. 
So let's actually start trying to make it actually do something real. So I'm going to add in here a modifier so that the parent can decide where it's actually going to position it, things like that. And we will pass in a camera position state just in case somebody wants to pass that in. And let's see, so we have on map loaded, that's good. So now what we need to do is inside here, actually do something about putting the map on the screen. So let's have, instead of that, a Google map. And this comes from that Google map compose support. And we're gonna pass in our modifier. So he'll show up exactly where we wanted him to. And we're gonna pass in our camera position state. And we will say on map loaded equals on map loaded. So when he's saying we're loaded, it's gonna pass that on out to the outside. <clears throat> and I think that's all I wanna set in him for the moment. Let's see if that's gonna work. Oops, somebody is not happy. Oh, well, because I changed parameters. So I need camera position state and modifier being passed in. So camera position state and modifier. So he's gonna fill the size of his parent. So we'll just use fill max size there. And let's try running this now. So here's our loading happening. And then we're getting a completely blank screen. And that usually means there's a problem with the key. Let's take a look at our log cat and see if I'm gonna go ahead and say map. Oh, there it is, it's loaded. It just took a little while to load. So poof, we now have a map, I can scroll around. I can double click to zoom. I can use these zoom controls. And we now have a map on there. And I said to uh, locate it somewhere around the, uh, the Google headquarters around in here. So, so far so good. We have a map, yay. So that's the first thing you wanna try to do is get to that point so you actually know your API key is working. Then we can start doing some more interesting things with it. Let's go ahead and have it put uh, a marker on the screen. So let's see, is there anything? Well, before we do that, let's um, add in some uh, properties and where is he down here? Let's come up to here. I'm gonna add in a val UE settings equals remember. So I'm gonna create a single instance of this and just hold on to it so that anytime I recompose, I'm not recomputing it. I'm gonna have map UE settings, and I can pass a few things in here. I can say compass enabled equals true. Uh, tilt gestures, actually let's just do rotation gestures enabled. So these might let us actually twist around inside the map as well. So in our uh, Google map here, I can say UE settings equals UE settings. And let's also specify what kind of map we want to display. So I'm going to say var map properties by remember, and it's going to be a mutable state of map properties with a map type equals map type normal. So just our normal view to start with. I'm making this a variable because I'm going to have a little drop down a little later. It's going to let us switch to satellite and other types of uh, map settings. So then inside here, I can say map properties equals map properties. And that's not the name for it. What is the name for it? Just properties. There we go. And let's see what this looks like now. Okay, so I'm going to hold down the control key uh, while I'm mousing over inside the emulator. And you'll notice that it gives me where two fingers are. So I can actually use that to pinch and zoom as I'm clicking the mouse here. Uh, or I can actually rotate with it, which is, gives us that rotate. And notice when the rotate happens, we get our compass appearing up there. 
If we click on the compass, we go back to north up, and then eventually the compass just will fade away. Now, if I don't want to support that, generally I don't like supporting the, uh, uh, the pinch to twist. Um, it just depends on what the application is trying to do. Uh, if you wanted to set it up so that the application is always facing which direction you're facing, you're going to want that, that rotation support. But I'm going to come in here and say, nope, I do not want these features. And then when I rerun, I should see that I'm trying to rotate and I can't. So that can kind of help you lock things down a little bit there. So far, so good. Now let's go ahead and try to put a, uh, a point on the map. So what I want to do is, let's see, here's our Google map. Inside of here, I'm going to add stuff. So you can just specify what you want to appear inside the map. So I'm going to say marker info window uh, content. So this is actually going to give me a marker with some content that'll display when you click it. So we need a little state for him. And let's see, we'll put him up at the top in this one. I'm gonna say Val Google HQ marker state. Um, and actually don't wanna do this or pass this in. Let me pass in the lat lawn there. So let's say, um, the location that we want to, I'm going to call it a place, the place that we want to actually highlight on the map. That's going to be a lat long. And so let's go and change this to say place state. And he's going to be equals, remember marker state, which is a helpful function here, where we can just pass in position equals place. And this is just a guy who's going to do a remember create a marker state inside of it with a position inside that's set to place. So it's just a little bit simpler to do there. Um, again, we're creating one and holding it inside of the slot table for Jetpack Compose. And then we're gonna reuse that over and over again, rather than recreating that thing every single time. So now that we have that, we can actually create a little marker window for us. So I'm gonna say the state for this equals the place state. And let's give it a little title in the window. Now just to keep things a little bit snappier while we're doing this lecture, I'm going to go ahead and hardwire strings like this. These again should be inside the strings.xml. And Let's make him draggable. Something kind of like that. And, whoops. Let's see if I can get this to actually, that's not where I wanted it. I want it out here. There we go. And let's, um, I think, That's interesting. I, I'm looking at the example that I had here and I had um, some text for the marker showing up separate from the title. Let's try this as it is to start with because I don't think what I had there was actually what I meant to have. And let's see if that'll actually put that on. We're gonna need to pass in the position which is gonna be Google Headquarters. And run that. So now our map is loading and there's our point. Now, if I click on it, it comes up saying sample description, which is the description that showed up in there. And now I can zoom in and we'll see that he's going, I guess this is actually more the shoreline amphitheater, not really Google headquarters. Uh, well, the Google Plex is over here, so it's pretty close. Um, now, if I long press on this, it pops up a little bit. And the reason it pops up is to get out of the way your finger. So if we're assuming that on a phone, you're gonna use your finger to do this. And then I can just drag it where I want. And when I let go, it's gonna tell us when the, the user let go there. And uh, we can actually see the location and 
change something else if we wanted to. So in order to do that, let's add in some click support. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to say val marker click. Actually, let me not do it there. I'll just do it in line down here. So we will come down here and say, oops, I went too far up. On click, that's going to pass in a marker. And then I can say camera position state dot projection. So if I know where I am on the map, the projection of the camera position state is the bounds of the screen. And it tells us the zoom information, what the center point is and what, you know, how big it is. So if there's actually a projection available, then I want to do something with it. I want to say the user clicked there. I'm just going to go ahead and use log for right now. I'm going to say log dot D. I'm going to pass in maps one. Why not? And then we're going to say clicked at dollar it dot. Let's just say visible region. I think there's actually a Isn't there a visible region dot? Well, that's, that's, the, that's actually not what I wanted to have it do. Um, I thought there was like a center or something. There we go, lat long bound center. A um, little verbose, but what is the unhappy about here? Required a Boolean found int. Oh, so the result of this guy, uh, it's it's looking for something to say if you handled it or not. So I'm going to say true there. So this should tell us the center of where the user clicked. Or what's actually the center of the screen in this case. That's not really what I wanted to do. I really just wanted to say the marker. Might help if I were paying attention. Position. There we go. So this is going to say where it was clicked, and this will just say the screen bounds. And I can just say show the visible region. Or just the projection itself should be fine, I think. That'll give all the information. There we go. Okay, so this should actually add to the log whenever we click someplace. Um, we'll deal with the drag in a little bit here. Let's go ahead and run it. And I'm going to bring the log cat up so we can actually see this. And I'm clicking on the eye on the marker here. And every time I click it, it's telling me right where it is. So it's telling me which marker we're clicking at. Now if I long press and then drag somewhere. It's not showing us a click, but if I click on it here, it'll tell us the new position that we had moved it to. Okay, so, so far so good. Any questions on anything so far? Okay, so how did I... Ah, okay. So now let's say that we want to uh, keep track of where it was actually let go when we dropped it. Um, the example that I was using from uh, this from uh, on the Google site was keeping track of a circle on the screen that we're gonna paint and then moving the circle to wherever we let go of the, the marker. So to do this, let's keep track of a var circle center by remember, and then mutable state of, and I wanted a, oh, actually I can do remember marker state. Oh no, mutable state of whatever the place was. So we're gonna start off with the actual place that the marker was. That's gonna be where our circle center was. 
And then I'm going to put a little code here. I'm just going to copy it over. And place state is what I called this. So then the state of this marker as we move it around, we're going to say if at the point that we're redrawing, the drag state is the end of a drag, I'm going to do something inside of here. So this will be place state as well. So we're going to say move the circle center to there. Now when the circle center changes, we can draw the circle in a different spot. So let's add in our circle inside here. So there's a circle and we can say circle center. And then we can add a little bit extra information in there for colors and things like that. So let's do a fill color and we'll say Material theme dot colors dot whatever my secondary color is for the theme. And then stroke color is going to be material theme colors dot secondary variant. So we'll just there's a different sets of colors you can define for a theme. These are a couple of them. Then we need to say how big we want this to be. I'm going to say it's going to be a thousand meters, I believe it's set up. Uh, let's see, radius, just a double uh, in meters. Yes, so it's in meters. So it'll be a thousand meter radius wherever you did it. Now, one thing that's interesting about the projection that's being used on Google Maps is the closer you get to the, the poles, it's going to change the size of what you're seeing on the screen uh, just because it's the, the information is getting more dense up near the poles. So it's going to look bigger. Uh, and that'll apply no matter where you move it. Um, that's a little awkward for some types of map operations. I've worked with Google Maps in the past and had to do things like drawing boxes. And if I'm letting the user draw a box on the screen, being able to turn that into the right sets of coordinates, they have a bunch of uh, uh, functions to do that, um, but it can be a little challenging. <laughs> okay, so we got that. There's our circle. Our circle should be drawn at the circle center. The circle center is going to start at the place the icon, the marker was. When we when we drag it, as soon as we're done dragging, it's going to change the circle center. So we should see the circle change. Let's try that. So there's our circle. And now if I'm going to long press on the marker, drag it somewhere, let go, and boom, we move the circle there. So it's some simple interaction that we're doing with that. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is set it up so that we can change the type of map being displayed. So what I'm going to do is, create, is change the overall screen to be a column with a little area at the top to be able to choose, using a dropdown, which uh, map type to display. And then whenever that changes, change the map type. So that should be fairly easy. Um, the first thing I want to do is define that section at the top that's going to be my controls. So we're going to create a little composable function here, and we're going to call it map type controls. And I took the concept from the uh, the example. They were using buttons on the screen to do this. I changed it into a drop down because I thought it'd be interesting to show you how you can do a drop down uh, to choose things. Uh, so we're going to come in here and say our current value is going to be a map type. We'll pass in a modifier. And we'll say on map type click is going to be, we'll take a map type and we'll do something with it. Now inside of this composable, we're going to keep track of some state to say if it's exposed, if it's uh, currently expanded or not. And depending on the type of state that you want in your application, some state you're going to want to push all the way up to your view model so that it'll remain over rotations of the screen. In this case, I'm just going to keep it local so that it's you know not in anybody else's way. It's you know not going to be polluting any namespaces. But what that means is that if I rotate the screen and it's recreated, the expanded state's going to go back to its default. Now, for a case like a dropdown, I think that's perfectly fair. Um, if you really want to, you can keep track of each of these inside your view model. I don't recommend it. So a state like this, I think, is good to have just inside of a function. So I'm going to say var expanded by, remember, 
mutable state of false. So we're going to start him saying he's not expanded. And then we're going to have an exposed drop down menu box. So this is going to be an area that's going to contain the, uh, the current values displayed and the drop down menu that's going to either be there or not. So expanded here is just going to use that expanded state. And then when expanded changes, so if somebody clicks on the little expander widget, I'm going to say exposed, oops, expanded, hello, equals not expanded. So we'll just toggle it. And then we're going to have stuff that shows up inside there. Actually, I want to have a modifier as well. So I'm going to say modifier equals the modifier that's passed in. So we'll take up however much space the caller is telling us. And then inside of here, I'm going to have some stuff. Now, most of the examples for using this expanded uh, exposed drop down menu box use a text field, which is an editable field, just because of the way it looks. Some people like that, that appearance, and I think it works pretty well here. So we'll use that, but we're going to make it be uh, read only so that nobody can actually edit it. Now, if you wanted to, you could also use this. The user could directly type things and then use that to filter the list or use that to actually pick a value directly without having to click on the items. Um, or potentially add in a new item. Just depends on what you want to do behind the scenes. We're going to keep it real simple and just have a fixed set of values that comes from the maps. The map is going to tell us what types of maps are available. So we'll have a text field. And his value is going to be the current value coming in, the name of it. So whatever map type's coming in, we're just going to display his name. I'm going to say read only equals true, just to make sure he's not going to show up. Let's give him a label. And this has to be a composable. So we're just going to pass in a little text. And I'm going to say text equals map type. Once again, that should be strings.xml. And on value change is what's going to happen if the user edits the field. Well, since we had read only equals true, that's never going to get called. So I'm just going to use an empty lambda on him. And let's pass in our modifier. And what I want to do is make sure that this guy, this text field, fills the entire width of the parent because I want him to be up at the top of the column or at the top of that box, however he is. So I'm going to say modifier fill max width. There we go. And a couple of little things here. The color set that I want to use for this guy is going to be, whoops, expose drop down menu defaults dot text field colors. So this is going to be a set of colors that can be used for, uh, why is that unhappy? Oh, API is experimental. So I'm going to go ahead and opt in for experimental up there. And let's see. So there's the colors are set. It's going to pull that from how this guy likes to do his coloring. And then finally, I want to put a little icon inside the field. So I'm going to have trailing icon. Oh, come on. Equals expose defaults dot trailing icon expanded. And the expanded state here will tell it if the icon is pointing up or down. And then when the user clicks on it, it'll toggle that. And let's see. So this guy, what is he unhappy about there? Uh, I just double check value, label, read only, on value change, trailing icon, colors, and modifier. So why is he not able to pick which one?
I'm just going to check what I imported. That looks good. It might be because I haven't finished specifying all the stuff for the exposed drop down menu box. Sometimes the, the type inside here won't actually get picked up right until you've filled in all the details. So let's fill in the, the drop down menu itself. So exposed drop down menu. And expanded is going to be, again, expanded. And on dismiss, we're just going to say, and this should be whenever the user taps outside of the area that they're they're working with, and we'll pass him a modifier. So mod this one's going to be film max width as well, and I think that's all we need up there. So now we need to actually walk through all the values to display inside this drop down menu. So I'm going to go to map type dot values because map type is an enumeration. We can actually walk through all the values that are inside that enumeration. And I'm going to give it a for each. And we're going to have a drop down menu item. There he is. And on click is going to be. Let's say on map type click passing in the map type just so we know what's going on and we'll close it. And then what's actually going to appear there is going to be text equals it dot name. Okay, so that still didn't fix these guys up. So I'm not quite sure what Let me try just copying over what I had. Maybe I just have some random punctuation that was off. So it's the same content, just in a slightly different order. And now it's working. So not sure why that wasn't working before, but uh, now it is working, so that should be good. So this should have us give us this little drop down box with a text field at the top, and then the actual items will drop down whenever it's expanded. <clears throat> so that's just an example of how to do one of these drop downs. So we're going to want to make sure that this appears at the top of the screen. And then the, uh, the, the Google map is going to show up underneath it. So we'll go back up to here where we had our Google map. And instead of just having him by himself, I'm going to make it a column. And his modifier is going to be the modifier that came in. So he's going to fill up this, whatever the screen is. And then we're going to have the map type controls. And the current value is going to need to be the current map type. So we need to keep track of him. So let's have a var current map type by remember mutable state of map type dot normal. So we'll just start off as, as the normal map type there. Pass him in there. So current map type. And the modifier for this guy is going to be fill max width. So we want him to fill that entire space. And then on map type click is going to be the last part here. Let's just go ahead and put him on the outside. So when we click it, I'm going to say, let's change our map properties. And because map properties is a data class, I can use the copy function to do this and I can say map type equals whatever map type is being changed to. So I'm just going to change the entire map properties object, which is immutable, make a copy of it with all the same values, but change the map type itself. And then we'll keep track of current map type is it as well. So that should allow us to change that. I'm going to move my Google map. up here. So he's going to be inside the column. And I'm going to tweak his modifier. Instead of being the overall modifier, I'm going to say that I want a fill max width and I want to give him a weight of 1F. So he takes up the remaining part of, this, of the column after the map type controls have been given, given space. 
So I think that'll do it. And then whenever that map properties changes, it's going to recompose Google Map, which should change the type of map displayed. Let's give it a try and see what happens. So there's our map and notice that we have the map type normal at the top. When I click on it, it gives me my drop down. I can choose satellite and now it is slowly reloading it. So now I have my satellite. I can take there. Well, that circle's kind of annoying now, isn't it? Let's go ahead and uh, get that circle out of there. And we're going to change ourselves to satellite. I can zoom in and see what's down there. Hey, I'm uh, in a uh, building next to a, actually I'm on a basket, basketball court. How about that? So that's where I actually have, have decided I'm going to be. Okay, any questions so far? So that's kind of the first part of the example that I wanted to do. We're going to uh, tweak a few things here and make it so that it's it's going to be more useful toward where the assignment's going to go. So to do that, I'm going to make a copy of this guy. I'm going to call it main activity two. And we'll rename him to main activity two. We'll rename this to Google map view two. There we go. So that should be good there. So now what I want to do, let's see, what was this guy doing that's different? Oh, I want to change the icon type first. So the, the, the thing that I want to do in this example is change it so that I'm going to be drawing a car icon and it, instead of those little pointy icons. <clears throat> so let's take a look at a car icon. It's going to copy it over. And this car icon is going to go underneath res drawable. And I'll just show you what he looks like. He's an SVG, uh, a, a scalable vector graphics file here that is going to, I mean, it's an Android version of a scalable vector graphics. That's going to draw this little guy on the screen. Now note that this is not part of that icons package. So we're going to need to, to pull this in and do something with it. Inside maps, we need something called a bitmap descriptor in order to display it. And a bitmap descriptor has bitmap behind the scenes and some information, metadata about it. Uh, so we need to load this in as a bitmap. What I've done is made a little set of helpers here called drawable helpers. And uh, these are, uh, I, I've kind of built these up over the years to be able to take a drawable like that file that's inside res drawable and bring it in as a bitmap or bring it as a bitmap descriptor so these are some helper functions there now this particular file I also did a couple other things with I'm going to show you an example of how you might want to put a license on it and I've also set up DACA comments on this so you can run the DACA tool to uh, uh, generate documents for it each of these brackets here is a reference to something. So if I control click on it, it'll jump to wherever the definition is uh, and it'll create that type of link in the actual documentation um, and has the list of your uh, parameters. There's a sample here, this load bitmap function. This is a little sample function here using that uh, get, uh, get bitmap. The, the two bitmap, I believe, yeah, the two bitmap function here. So this can actually show up when you use it. So just wanted to give you kind of an example of what those are going to do. We're going to be using this guy here to load a bitmap descriptor. And what he's going to do is load the bitmap with that ID. So he's going to call this function here to actually grab it from the context and then convert it to a bitmap descriptor using this function down here. Once you have that, you can use it to, as an icon inside your application. So we've got our car, we've got that. And in our main activity two, let's see, what are the air issues here? So map type, map controls. Um, I will, for this example, I'm not gonna have map controls. So I'm gonna get rid of him. And up here, we can get rid of him as well. 
and we don't need the current map type. We don't need the circle center. We can get those out of the way. Don't need that guy. And I don't think we're going to need map properties because uh, we're not changing it, but I'm going to go ahead and leave that as a val for now. And we can get rid of our circle down here. There we go. So we want to change our icon type in here. And what I'm going to do is I only want to load this once. So I'm going to, at the top of this function, because this is the only one who cares about that icon, I'm going to create this car icon using remember for a bitmap descriptor starting as null. And then once I come in here to do my initial compose, I want to kick off a job to read in that icon. Once the icon's ready, it can actually be used to display. So I'm going to set up a launched effect here which he's going to only happen once. So I could pass in a true, I could pass in a unit, whatever you want to do for that guy. And because true isn't going to change on there. And then inside here, I'm actually going to load this guy. Now I want to do this on the IO dispatcher. So I'm going to say with context dispatchers.io. And then I'm going to say car icon equals, well, I need a context. And this is an Android context. You can get that inside of any composable function by saying local context.current. Local context is a special beast. Um, what the heck was it called? A, um, hmm, I'm blanking on the name of the thing, but it's basically, it gets set when you first of all do your set content call. And this gets set and is available through anything that's called underneath set content. So we had set content up here. It's going to set that guy and then it's available underneath there. Use these super, super sparingly. They're pretty easy to define, uh, but they can kind of add a little bit of mystery to what's going on when you look at it. Uh, it also can make testing a little more difficult. Uh, in this particular case, it's okay because you're going to run it in a test context that actually sets up a context for you. Um, but if you start doing this with a lot of functions, it's going to make your life a little bit trickier to keep track of and a little trickier to test. Uh, so don't define your own ones of these too often. And I'm completely blanking on the name of what these are called. Um, it'll hit me in about 20 minutes, I think. So inside here, I'm going to use that context to load a bitmap, r.drawable.iccar for the car icon. And let's see, what is he complaining about? Found a bitmap. Oh, load map, map descriptor. There we go. And poof, that should load up our car icon. We can now use that guy when we're defining our marker. So I come in here and I can say icon equals car icon, just like that. And let's see what happens when we run this. Uh, you know, I want to put my circle back. It's actually going to help demonstrate something a little bit better here. So where was my circle center? Uh, I call that place state. And, oh, I forgot to actually switch which examples running. So I'm going to go to my manifest and say main activity two. I guarantee you that's not going to be the last time I forget to change that. And there we have our car. But notice how the car doesn't look centered. When you have an icon, the icon has a, pl a place on it called the anchor. And the default anchor for an icon is the bottom center. So if you think about that little pointy icon that we had, he was pointing to the center of this circle. This guy here, we're saying use the bottom center of the icon, which is about here. And that's where the, the point is actually being uh, located. The anchor on the icon goes from zero to one, both X direction and Y direction. So if it's 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it's actually the center of the icon. Think about it if you put a pin through that anchor and then put the pin on the map. That's how it's going to match it up to where it's going. So if the default icon is 0 0.5 and 1, 
meaning it's the bottom center edge, the pin is going to go right through the bottom center edge of the icon. That's what we're seeing here. And that's great for an icon like the little pointy thing that we're using before, or, or a pin icon. But for this guy, we really want to put it right in the center. So we need to redefine that anchor. We're going to come down to our marker info. I'm going to say anchor, and he's going to be an offset of 0.5F, 0.5F. So it should be right in the center. And when I run it now, I should see that I, the car line up with the center of the circle. There we go. So keep this in mind. Uh, and this is actually a good reason why this circle was here. Um, in the example that they gave, they didn't do anything like this, but uh, I realized that this would actually be a good way to show you how that anchor works. Uh, if you don't think carefully about this when you're placing icons, you can get some slightly off pins and uh, it, you know, may get some bug reports based on that. Okay, so there, is our example there with uh, the, the uh, icon there. Now what I want to try to do is let's put multiple icons on the map and do a couple things with them. What I want to do is have them show up on the map one at a time and then animate the bounds of my screen so that it makes sure that they're all visible. And then we're going to add some lines between them. And this is, you know, a little contrived because you're going to have to do something similar with your assignment. But uh, it's something that can be really useful if you want to make sure that certain area, certain points are visible on the screen. How do you do that? So let's take that main activity two and copy it as main activity three. And I'm going to rename him and rename the map view. And he doesn't have his top anymore there. And this time I'm definitely going to get rid of the circles. So we'll have him go away. We're going to use the car icon, and I want to put him in three locations. So let me grab a little list of cars that I've predefined here. And instead of having that Google headquarters defined, I'm just going to use this list of cars. And the first one will just be my default position there. Okay, so let's see what else is unhappy inside here. So the place here that we're starting with, I'm going to set this up so that instead of keeping track of a single place I want to plot, I'm going to pass in a list of cars. So let's go to our Google Map view. And let's say cars. It's going to be a list of lat lawn, which could be empty. And... Then what I'd like to do is well, let's start off just by displaying all of them and then we can actually, well, no, I'll go ahead and skip to this step here. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of the cars I want to display, which we're just going to have a little launched effect walk through and every couple seconds change that list to display so we can see the cars appear one at a time. So Let's come into, I think maybe about here, and we'll say var cars to display by, remember, mutable state of, and it's going to be an empty list of lat long. There we go. So that's going to be which cars we want to display, and it's going to start off empty. And what I'd like to do is kick off a little coroutine so that every three seconds we're going to add another car on there. So we're going to say, give me a launched effect. Once again, I'm going to pass in either true or unit or something like that that's not going to change. And then we're going to walk through the list of the cars and display them. I'm going to do this on the default dispatcher because I'm not doing any type of I.O. here. I'm just adding things to a list. But I do want to do it in the background because of these delays. So I'm going to say with context dispatchers.default, which is just going to be some random background work. And I'm going to start by delaying for three seconds. And then I'm going to say cars to display equals cars to display plus, oops, I need a, uh, a loop in here, huh? Cars for each, kind of like that. 
and we'll say car as the variable name. And there we go. Although let's take a look at this for a second. The way I define this is it's going to run once and never rerun again. It's never going to cancel. But take a look inside this function. There's actually some state that this depends on. This, this little coroutine, it matters what the car list looks like. And if we define it like this, it's going to capture that cars once and ignore any changes that are coming in from the outside. So we really don't want to do that. What we really want to do is change this to be cars. And so now if cars changes while this is running, it's going to cancel the existing one that's running and restart a new one so we can uh, update our cars to display. Um, now also notice in here that it's only adding. So what I really want to do at the start is clear it. So I'm going to say cars to display equals empty list. Alternatively, what I could do is have cars to display say remember cars. And then it'll recompute this anytime the cars changes. So basically it'll blank it out automatically whenever the cars change. This is a little more expensive because I'm setting up another mutable state wrapper on it. So doing it in here, it's going to save us just a wee bit. So I'm going to get rid of that guy. But just a couple things you keep in mind. You can have the dependencies set up this way so that it'll recompute based on that. So this should update cars to display. And now what we want to do is uh, set up the cars being displayed. And this was my Google Map 3. Yes, okay. So, um, oh, actually, this is not the function I wanted to do those in. I wanted these to be in the caller, I think. And for your example, that you're, for your assignment, you're actually going to be keeping track of this data inside of your view model. So in here, I can put this there. And now my Google Map view, I'm just going to say cars equals cars to display. So this is being calculated outside of the map and passed into the map. Um, you're going to keep track of these inside your view model for your, your alien spaceships. So now here I'm going to pass the cars in. And then what I want to do <coughs> is actually display those little markers on the screen. And let me just double check here. So we'll notice here that we have this place state that's doing this remember marker state. And remember marker state is doing a remember creating a marker state inside of it. So it's just a little bit of a shortcut. What I want to do is say, based on the cars, I want to create a marker state for each of those cars. So I need to map that. So uh, here, instead of saying, remember marker state, I'm going to say, remember based on cars. So whenever the cars change, I'm going to recompute this value. And I'll just say cars.map marker state of it dot position um, wasn't there a position or something like that? oh it is actually a, law, a lat lawn there already so just it so this is going to say take each car in the list create a marker state containing the lat lawn which is what the car is in the list and the map just creates a new list of all those marker states so place state is going to be a list of those marker states um, Let's say, let's rename this to be marker states. Okay. Or we could call it car states. Let's call it car states. Why not? So now down in here, for this marker window info, we're going to have one of these for each car that's going to be displayed. So we're going to say car states for each. Whoops. We're going to move this guy inside. And let's call this car state. Kind of like that. And then in here, this is going to be car state for where he goes. Now I want to change the description. Instead of being sample description, I want it to be car and whatever number the car is. So I need to get a hold of which car number we're dealing with. 
Fortunately, there's an alternative version of for each called for each indexed. And what it does is it keeps track of which number we're working through, which item number in the list, and passes it in as the first parameter. So this Lambda can now know which one I'm dealing with and the actual item itself. So I can come down here and say car dollar n, boom. And again, this still should be in the strings.xml. You just use a placeholder for that where you would set that when you're calling string resource. And I believe that will display my cars one at a time. What is unhappy up here? Why is control shift O not working? Now it is. Okay, and let's try running it. What we should see is an empty map to start with, if of course I remembered to modify my Android manifest. Uh, so let's come over here and we'll say main activity three. Told you that wasn't gonna be the last time I forgot that. I almost always forget to change that. So empty, and now it's gonna start putting my markers on the map. And you'll notice that it doesn't look like much is changing. There's just slight changes in where they are. It's because we're zoomed out pretty, pretty dis distant here. So if I zoom in, I'm going to see these cars at different spots on the map, which is pretty cool. And let's see, which zoom level did I use on this? 18. So let's tweak this to be zoom level 18, and it should be a little nicer to, to watch what's going on. Let's try running that now. Loading the map. And then there's the first one, there's the second one, and the third one is off screen. If I pan, we'll see these up in there. So this is where I want to start looking at how can I change the bounds of the view to make sure that all the icons that I'm dealing with are actually visible. So to do that, what I want to do and let's see, where am I doing this? I'll do it up in my top level. Um, yeah, that actually sounds pretty good. So I've got these cars to display. And actually, I should make that be dependent on cars. Well, no, we're doing it here. That's right, I, I talked about that. Never mind. So, um, what I'd like to do is whenever this cars to display changes, I want to create a lat long bounds object that represents the biggest bounds containing all of those cars. So I'm going to come in here and unfortunately the way this is going to work, I can't just do remember because lat long bounds is actually a variable that you really have to change. It's an immutable object. You're going to call a function on it to include a new thing, but then it actually returns a whole new object. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna internally inside of a launched effect, another one of these wonderful launch effects, um, I'm going to keep track of all of the, uh, um, uh, I'm gonna create a brand new lat long bounds object and then include all the points and then tell the camera position to change. So let's take a look at how we can do that. Now I could combine that with this launched effect because it's based on car on the cars as well. Um, no, this is the cars to display one. Never mind. So we'll say launched effect. This is going to be based on cars to display. And what I want to do in here is say if cars to display is not empty. So if I have any cars that I want to display, then I'm going to manage the camera. So we'll come in here and we're going to say, give me a bounds, which is going to be a lat long bounds object. I'm going to start it as null because we don't really have anything to define for the bounds at that point. And then what I'm going to do is say, take cars to display and walk through it. Oops. For each. And I'm going to say, let's update the bounds. So the bounds is either going to be, if I have one that's existing already, add a point to it. If I don't have one that's existing, initialize it with the point. So I'm going to say, if I have bounds, I'm going to say 
including the new point that I'm dealing with. Actually, let's say car here just to make sure that we're not losing track of our ifs. So we'll take the existing bounds and include a new bound, a new point, which creates a new bounds object. Or if I don't have an existing bounds, I want to create one. So I'm going to create a lat long bounds object passing in the car for both of his corners. And the corners on this guy are going to be the southwest and the northeast corner. By using the same point for both, it's just a single point bound. And then what I want to do is after all that, if I have a bounds object, then what I want to do is tell the camera position to change. Now the camera position is going to be an animation that's going to happen, and I want to have that happen off of the user interface thread for changing that state. So that means I need a scope. So we're going to say, remember coroutine scope. We're going to launch a little coroutine. And then we can say, hey, camera position state. Do some animation for me. And I want to animate to a certain point, or in this case, to a certain lat long bound box. So I can say, give me a camera update factory. So we're going to create a camera update. I want to do a new lat long bounds passing in that bounds. Uh, actually, let's do this. So we're actually capturing a new one there. And I want to give it a little bit of slack around there. So I'm going to give it like a hundred meter slack. Is that about how much I used? Let me see if that's how much I used. Yeah, we'll give it a hundred meter slack there. And I want to have that animation happen over a certain time period. So I'll give it a, a one second time to do the animation. And that should be all we need to do to do this. Let's take a look at what happens. So we'll see for these first two cars, you notice how he zoomed right into where he is. Now it's going to zoom out to have both of them, and then it's going to zoom out to include the third one as well. And this is something you're going to do in your example as the aliens are appearing over Washington, D.C. You're going to have the screen change its bounds. So you make sure you see all of them as you're going. Now, one other thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to draw lines between positions that the UFOs are at. You're going to have multiple UFOs, and each UFO is going to move. As they move, they're going to draw lines, uh, kind of you know, you know, visible lines in the sky to spell out a message. And so we want to be able to see that message. So we need to add some support here to be able to draw those lines. So um, I'm going to do the lines inside of this Google Map view here based on all the icons that are displayed. Now you're going to have to think through this a little bit more for your example and how you're going to pass something in to say which lines to draw. I would recommend you don't associate the lines with the currently displayed icons. Has some other data structure to represent your lines that you want to draw. So, but for this example, I'm going to do something pretty simple here. I'm going to come down and say, let's see, there's my Google map view. I want to go down to this guy. So in my map, I'm currently displaying all these little markers, which if I click on them, Why are they not displaying there? That's interesting. Maybe it's because I, well, they said they're draggable. Huh. For some reason, the uh, message isn't popping up. I'm gonna have to take a look and see if I can figure out why that's happening. Oh, it's because I overrode the click handler. So if I, do this, the default click handler should display the little um, uh, title. There it is. And so now if I go over here, there's car one. Oh, and it's also centering it, which is a little bit unfortunate on these. Um, you're not going to be using uh, any type of labels on yours, though. 
Okay, so after all that loop there, I'm going to want to put a polyline on the screen. And a polyline has multiple points and draws all those draws lines between all those points on the screen. Um, if you're doing this in your application, you can have a separate polyline for every single line segment, or you can have a separate polyline for each letter that's being drawn on the screen. So if you think about it for each UFO, he has several positions that he's been traversing. Those are going to be the ones that you're going to use for your polyline list for that particular letter. So for this one, I'm just going to draw between those three guys by saying, let's look at my car states. I'm going to map them into just the positions. So I'm just pulling out the lat lawn so that all I have is a list of lat lawns, which is what the polyline does. And now when I run this, we should see lines appear between these guys. And there we go. So this allows you to mark up your map however you want to. And if you can imagine drawing directions on the screen, if you knew which places you wanted to turn, you can, and there's actually an API from Google you can call to do that, but you need to pay for that one. Uh, you could present the, the, uh, uh, the navigation directions inside of your application. Now there is a restriction on using their data for real-time navigation. So if you get the navigation data, you are not allowed to do real-time navigation with that. You have to go over to Google Maps to be able to do that. We'll see how to do that in a little bit. Let's go ahead and take a break. It's 6.05. Let's start back up at 6.15. So uh, during the break, I went ahead and made a copy of Main Activity 3 as Main Activity 4. Uh, I added back in the little drop down that lets you choose the map type. I thought that was actually kind of nice because then you can actually see the parking lot that I'm dealing with here. Uh, and I actually did put the cars in the parking lot. It's like, ooh, exciting. Um, or we could change them to you know, a hybrid that actually has little outlines and names and things like that. Or go back to our normal. So what we're going to do now is try to set it up so that we can remember where the car was parked. To do that, I want to add a little toolbar at the top or a top bar at the top that is going to uh, give us an icon that lets us remember our location. Now that's going to require us to know what the location is. So we're going to have to add in the location API as well. So first thing, let's go ahead and add in that uh, little top bar. And we'll come down over here and I'm going to do an at composable and we'll say private fun uh, let's see, car top bar. And then this guy is going to be a top app bar with a title. And we will say it's going to be text. Text equals car finder. And then actions. Those are going to be our buttons on the top bar. And did I need anything else? I think that was it, just that and the actions. So depending on what state we're in, we're going to have different actions showing up. So let's see. The type of state we're going to pass in is, do we have a current location? That means we know where we are based on the GPS. You have to have that before we can actually place a, uh, a car on the screen. Do we know where the car is? So we have a car lat long, which is going to be a lat long. So if we have a remembered location, we're going to allow the user to walk there. Um, and then, or they can clear it. So then we can also have some functions here. So on set car location, and it's going to be that. On clear car location, and on walk to car. Those will be our little functions there. Now I'm going to assume that outside of this function, it knows where the car is. It knows where the, uh, the current location is for doing these functions. So we don't have to pass these values in. But we're going to use some of these values to determine if an icon is available. So up here I'm going to say, if we have 
current location is non-null, then I'm going to have an icon button, and his on click is going to be on set car location. And then inside here, he's going to have an icon. It's going to be an image vector of icons.filled. We'll use the little star for remembering where we are. And content description is going to be remember location. So there's that guy. And uh, then we can also say car lat long. Give him a little icon button. And this one, I'm going to need a little walking direction guy. Now the base, the base icon set doesn't have that. So I'm going to bring in the extended icon set. And this is one of these things you want to be careful of because it's actually pretty large. It can really bloat your, your application. So you have two choices. You can either actually copy the icon definitions into your application, or you can use ProGuard to minimize and throw away the ones you aren't actually using. Um, it might be easier to actually copy this stuff over. I'm not going to go through that right now. I'd have to look up exactly how to do it because I can't remember where these things are defined. Um, but we will see. So I'm going to come into here and give us an implementation. Oops, I actually already had that. There's our extended icon, so I'm going to sync that. And then I can say, instead of star, uh, directions walk. So it'll give a little walking guy. Let's actually see, oh, there we go. So here's how we can actually do it. Once we have all the ones that we want, if you just control click on it, it'll actually take you to the source. And we can actually just copy this function right into our code. Um, this is the only one we're gonna need. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this guy. And he has this little private guy to, um, actually I can just copy the whole file. And we will paste him into here. And he is not working. Let's try this again. We will create a new file here. Directions walk. And paste, whoops. Paste everything in there. And I'm actually just going to move him. Well, we can just go ahead and put him to our, our package is fine. It's got the copyright notice from Android open source project where it's defined. But now we have this defined locally and I can actually get rid of the big guy. And we'll sync him. And note that this is an extension function. So he's defined on icons.filled, defines the directions walk, and he's actually not a function, he's an extension property. And so we can just use him directly and we should be able to what is it unhappy about? Oh, it's unhappy at the bottom there. So this guy now, well, it's composed maps. Wait a minute. Did that not resync? Because that should be giving us a Ah, okay, now it's pulling up the right one. I just had to refresh it again. So we now have that locally. Yay, that was easier than I thought it would be. So we've got him for remember location. And we also need to add clear location, which we can also do for the same exact reason here. So say on clear car location. And this is going to be, we'll use the delete icon, which is a common one. And we'll say forget location. I'm going to say remember car location, forget car location. So that should set up us a nice little uh, top app bar. 
and that should be good there. And so now we can put that up at the top of our application. So right now we've got a, this is the Google map view. We're bringing them in here in this box overall. So what I want to do is set up a scaffold around this. And we're going to have a top bar, car top bar. And we're going to pass in, let me go ahead and fix up the indentation on that. We have our current location, our car location, and how to set and clear our car location. Now this is something that I do want to put inside of a view model. So we're going to create a view model here. I'm going to call it the car view model. And this is going to be an Android view model. We're going to add constructor parameters. There we go. And so now inside the view model, we want to keep track of our location of our car and our current location. And we're going to, excuse me, we're going to expose those as flows. So to do this, the first thing we're going to do is define where our current location is. And the location setup is actually going to need to be managed by the activity, but we're going to use the car view model to hold on to it. And he's going to basically be our source of truth for the rest of our application. So unfortunately, there's not a super simple way to set things up for the, uh, uh, the location API. We can't do it uh, underneath someplace else. It has to be done from uh, uh, the view model, or sorry, from the, the activity. So we're going to start off by having just a, a placeholder to put some data in. So I'm going to say private val underscore current location, which is going to be a mutable state flow of null. We'll make that be a location question. And this is going to come out of Android location. Let me just double check that that's the right one. Yes. Okay. So this is going to be our internal bucket that we're going to emit things to. An immutable state flow just holds one value at a time. It can't ever have more than one thing going through. But other, other than that, it acts like any other flow that we're working with. Internally, it's going to be mutable, but I want to expose it as a flow of location, nullable, and give it a git that's going to just return the internal guy. And so what this does is this makes it so that outside of the view model, we just see it as an immutable flow. We can't emit things to it. We can't set its value. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have a little update function for this. And that's going to say current location that value equals location. And we could use either uh, set the value or emit to it. Either one of those will work just fine there. Um, and we could do some other functionality in here if we wanted to. Um, but this still gives us the control to handle what's happening when somebody wants to change it, as opposed to somebody just blindly being able to emit things to it. So now the other thing is to keep track of where the car currently is. And so what I want to do here is set it up so that the uh, the, the car is going to be saved to a preference. And the preference file is something that keeps track of values across runs of your application. And it's something a lot more lightweight than a database. So if you really want to have a lot of data, database is still going to be your best bet. But if you just have some settings values or some a couple little remembered values, those are good to put in preferences. So we're going to need to pull in the preferences API for that. And let's see, where is the... Uh, there he is. Oh, I think I may already have it. Let me take a look. Nope, I didn't bring that over yet. So I'm going to go ahead and just bring these ones over here. There we go. So I'm bringing in the Android X Preferences API, which allows us to save things to... Uh, 
the preferences. There's some newer ways to do things using something called a data store. Don't want to get into that. It's a little more complex. I'm just going to use the real simple preferences API for this. But keep in mind that you really should be looking at the pre at the data store stuff a little bit later on. For, uh, it, it, it allows you to uh, use suspending functions. The implementation up here for the place services location, I'm going to go ahead and just leave that in for now. We're going to need that as well. Let me sync this. And what I'm going to do is set this view model up so that whenever we change the value of the car, it's going to automatically save it for us. So let's uh, do this. Let's set it up so we're going to have a private, oops. val car lat long and he's going to be another mutable state flow so we're going to do the same kind of thing here but i want to give him a default value that i fetch from the preferences so i'm going to say hey preference manager i want you to get the default shared preferences for this application which is why i passed in the application up here and if I actually have that, well, I'm just going to actually set a variable for it. I'm going to say uh, it dot get string. And let's create a couple names for the, the preferences. We're going to call them in the, in the, the preference store. So I'm going to say private const. Oh, come on, fingers. Val lat pref is going to be lat. And lawn pref is going to be lawn for longitude. So we're going to go ahead and get the lat preference. If it's not defined, we're going to use a null for it. Now, unfortunately, there's no API for storing doubles inside the preference store. So we really have to do the conversion ourselves. It's not a big deal. Um, but if you did ints, there is actually a get int or floats as a get float, but doubles, it doesn't have that. So we're just gonna store them as strings and retrieve them back. So if we can get the lat preference, that I'm gonna say is lat string. And then we'll do the same kind of thing for the lawn. I'm gonna call him lawn string. And if we're able to do both of those, then I want to use the initial value of a lat long with the lat long inside of it. So I'm going to say lat long, passing in lat string to double. Whoops. There he is. And passing in lawn string to double. And so it'll only give us a value if both the lat and long are defined inside of the, uh, the preference store. Otherwise, it's going to get a null. All of this will just be a null, and so we'll just set the initial value to null. So that should set up a good initialization of this guy. And then we can actually expose that by saying val car lat long is going to be a flow of lat long nullable. And we're going to give it a getter, which is going to return the underscore version of that guy, the private one. So that's going to allow us to expose that to outside. Now I want to be able to give those couple functions for clearing and setting the lat lawn. So we're going to say fun clear car location. And what we're going to do is blank out both of those values for the preference store. So I'm going to bring a copy of this guy down. And instead of saying let, I'm going to say edit, which is going to give us an editor. And then inside here, I can just say remove. Actually, what? There, make sure I get that one there. I can say remove lat pref and lawn pref. And I will say car lat lawn value equals null. So we'll just blank that out internally. And boom, so that should clear up our function for us. Now to set it, it's just a hair more complex, but not much. And this is going to return a lat long in case we need it outside. And let's see. So we're going to say val 
new lat long equals take a look at that current location that's the internal one I'm just going to grab its value and I'm going to say if it's non null let me do something oops did I copy that whole thing I did well I'm going to need some of it and uh, if there is a value there then I want to do an edit and put the values in there so I'm going to take the same stuff here and we're going to say put string lat pref it dot latitude to string and we can do the same kind of thing with longitude here and so that's going to actually set it and then we're going to return a lat long with it dot latitude and it dot longitude. Otherwise, if we don't have that, then what we want to do is do a run and clear the car location and return a null. So what this is going to do is if there's currently a value available for our location, we're going to create a lat long based on it and notice that this is a location that gets returned by the location API, not a lat long. So there's a different kind of object, which is why I need to create this lat long here. If I don't have a current location, I'm going to clear the data inside, which is going to do those removes, and set the car lat long to null, and then we just return a null for our value. Once we have that, I can say car lat long value equals the new lat long. And then I'm just going to return that new lat long. Now I'll have to take a look at the rest of the code because I can't remember why I'm returning this. Um, I may need it in the middle of some function out in the UE. Uh, otherwise I'd be just setting this and then this will end up triggering the flow inside the UE to, to fetch the value. Okay, and we got the up Date, current location. I think that's all we need in here for right now. So let's take a look at where we're going to use this stuff. So the first thing I want to do is bring in the Play Services API. And this is a little tricky. Uh, Play Services API is, is really a wonderful idea. The, the whole point is they tried to move some stuff out of the core of Android into some libraries that can be updated. Uh, this sets it up so that we don't have to ha wait for OEMs to update things to get new modules for security, for location, for anything else like that. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is not all phones might have those libraries. The Play Services API not, might not be available. So setting things up is a little bit trickier here. Uh, we need to actually check to see if Play Services is available, and if it's available, then go ahead and check to see if the user wants permission to get these things, to get the lo location, and then go ahead and use it. So there's a few steps on there, and it's not super comfy with Jetpack Compose yet. So we're going to need to kind of work outside of the realm of Compose for a good chunk of this. So let's go back to our, main, our new main activity we're setting up here. And the first thing I want to do is expose our view model up here. So I'm going to say private val view model is a car view model by view models. And so this should fetch the view model that an instance of the view model and there only be one of these instances available for the activity. In order to use location, I need to be able to uh, take a look at the sensors on the device. And we have sensors for uh, find location on GPS, and you can have it in a couple different modes, fine or coarse mode. Alternatively, it could, if the GPS isn't available for some reason, we can actually take a look at cell towers or we can take a look at Wi-Fi hotspots to see if they provide some location information to kind of give us an overall rough area of where we're actually uh, currently existing. Um, 
that's a lot of work. So they put it all together in something called a fused location provider client. And we can create an instance of this guy. <coughs> and I'm going to say private laden it var fused location uh, provider client is a fused location provider client. Oh, how is that? Fused location provider. Why is he not showing up? I believe I had that in there. So I've got my place services location. Let me just check to see what external libraries are coming in here. Is location showing up here? Play services location is coming up in there. There he is. So why is it not being available? This is one of those times when Android Studios, I'm, I'm like, curse you. Uh, so let's see. Private Laden at var. I'm going to copy the name from over there. And it added the import. Huh. It just, for some reason, it wouldn't find it when I was hitting the control space. That's, that's not maddening at all. Now, a latent variable inside Kotlin is one that sets it up so that uh, we're promising the compiler, trust me, I will initialize this before I use it. And that's basically what you're trying to guarantee. The compiler is going to double check that and throw an exception if that's not the case. But the advantage here is that it sets it up so that you don't have to define this as nullable. And then you won't have to do nullable checks on it later on. Uh, so let's set up a private var current location by mutable state of, oh, wait a minute, that's in my view model. Why am I doing that one there? That's probably why my example didn't work before class. <laughs> okay, so we'll do a private val location callback. equals and I'm going to set up an object here that's going to listen for changes from the fused location provider and this is going to have to be an object because it has more than one function available in its interface so I'm going to say object colon location callback and again it's I just copy it over here Yeah, Android Studio is getting kind of messed up here. I'm about ready to do a file invalidate caches, but let's just see. I think it's getting confused by something because it should have found that. And then I'm going to override on location result. And this is going to tell us when it's actually found a location. And we don't need that. And so what I'm going to do is anytime the location changes, I want to tell the view model that the location has changed. So I'm going to say view model, update location, passing in. Oh, that got kind of messed up there. That's interesting. Location result dot last location. So the last location that it saw for that given result. So this should take the information from our fused provider client and send it to the view model. So the view model will know that the location has changed. Now what I'm going to need to do is whenever that location changes in the view model, we're going to keep track of that information. So he's just knowing that information so that whenever we do a set my car to this location, he knows about it. Now in order to use this location provider client, we need to make sure that the um, Google Play Services uh, API is available. Um, I not doing that in here? Maybe I actually cut that from this example. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. We need to make sure that our Google API is available and then check permissions to see if it's okay to use the, the location. So what I'm going to do with my onCreate is split things up a little bit. I'm going to take all this set content stuff, so the setting up of the UE, and move it into a function that I'm going to call if 
I'm successfully successful getting the Google uh, API uh, available. So I'm going to take all of this and the set content. And I'm going to create a new function here that I'm going to call start location. Oh, come on, fingers and map. I'm going to paste that inside there just to get it out of the way for the moment. And he needs to be a composable, I believe. Oh, no, he needs to be inside the um, activity. That's the problem. Because the activity is the one who knows about set content. That's better. Okay, so I just moved that down there. And what I want to do in my on create is I want to check to see if Google Play Services API is actually available. I'm going to actually just copy this chunk of code. And let's go to on create up here. And when the activity is created, I want to check to see, do I have accessibility to the Google API? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for it to try to make Google Play services available. Uh, if it's already available, it's just going to be a no-op. It's just going to immediately call the on success listener here. But if it's not available, it's going to have this little message here, and we're going to put up on the screen, Google Play services required or upgrade required. Um, this can happen for a couple different reasons, because if the, uh, the user says, no, I don't want to update this, or if it's just plain not available, then both of them go down to the add-on failure. And there's some other ways to structure this. This is a fairly simplistic way to do it. I've seen some other places where people take a look at the instance to see, is it available? If so, then call the make services available. Uh, and then they have one extra branch on their, their failure path. They can say, oh, it's just not plain available for this platform. Um, but I'm just going to leave it like this. It's, pre it's pretty close. So what we're going to do next is check to see, do we actually already have permission? So did the user grant us permission for find location or course location yet? And so I'm going to use these calls of activity compat check self uh, permission to see is find location not granted and access course not granted. Under those cases, I need to ask the user for the permissions because they haven't granted us yet. If they already are granted, I'm just going to call that start location and map function so that we can go ahead and do our work. But if we need to ask for permission, we need to ask for permission. And the user has to grant one of these two, find location or course location. So we're going to need to actually launch a permission uh, uh, function here. And this permission function is going to be outside of Compose. They do have some support for doing permissions inside Compose. Um, and there's other places you might use that. But for this, I think we really need to do it outside because of the way we're handling the uh, location information. So to do that, we need to create a little function that's going to be able to get the location permission. And I'm going to copy this one over as well because it's kind of hairy. Now note that for your assignment, you're not going to need location permission. You're not going to use location for anything. You're going to be setting locations on the map. So you're going to be putting things on the map at a certain location. You're not requesting where the user is. So you won't need to do this stuff for that. This is where everybody can go. Um, so what we're going to do is set up a little launcher called get location permission to go ahead and request that the, uh, the user grant us permission. So to do that, we're making this call to register for activity result. And this is kind of a really nice simplification of the way things used to work. You used to have to make a call and then have a callback called on activity result that would look at a response. Then you'd have to try to figure out, well, which request was it that I made and was it granted or not? Uh, and it could have been for a bunch of other things as well. Um, so here we're actually using it just to request multiple permissions. So when we launch it, we're going to pass in the permissions we want to use. And then this is called to tell us if those permissions are granted or not. So once we've got that uh, request off the ground, is granted is going to be a list of, or is it an array? I think it's an array. Uh, I believe it's an array. 
No, it's a it's a map. So it's a map of permission you asked and was it granted or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check up here and say if any of the permissions were granted. So in this case, either the course permission or the find per, uh, sorry the course location or the find location, then we're just going to go ahead and do our job. If not, we're going to pop up a dialog here and tell the user, hey, uh, you really need to do this because otherwise the application is kind of useless. Um, I'm not going to go through these details here. This is actually the old way to do dialogues and the non-compose way. And once again, since we're doing this outside of compose, we can't, you know, we obviously would have to do it in a non-compose way. At some point, we're probably going to work this support into compose so that we can actually use a dialogue in compose to do this. Um, and it becomes much, much cleaner. Uh, but this is kind of the old way, you know, build a dialogue and show it. And then based on this, if the user hits the negative button, the quit button, we're just going to finish the application. We're going to say, okay, the user doesn't want to continue. We'll do this. The positive button is called app info. And this takes them to the application info settings so they can actually change the permission and then come back. So that'll start an activity going outside of us to display the application information and let them change things. We're also going to call finish here because they're going to have to restart the application the way that we've written it here. There's some other ways we can do this that are a little more complex that can keep you inside the application. But like I said, it's a little more complex. I want to keep this nice and simple. So if the user goes out and changes permissions, they'll have to restart the application afterwards. Okay, so this launcher, we're going to need to launch to uh, check for those permissions, to actually request those permissions. So if we come down into here, we'll see now in this block where we were checking if the API is available, we've just defined that, so that's great. So we're gonna pass in access find location and access course location as the two permissions we wanna check for. Now you can't check for those unless they're in your manifest. So we need to go back to our manifest and add those guys in. So I'm gonna say, look for course location and find location for those two there. So now we've declared that we want these permissions, but at runtime, we need to actually go and ask for them. When that returns, it's going to use the body up there to do whatever we want. Now, in this case, if we have one of those permissions, it's going to call start location and map for us. That's great. Um, if it's a failure, you put that little toast up and then get out. Okay, so far, so good. So this should now, um, let me think here for a second. Once we register this callback, which we haven't done yet, it should update the user interface. So we need to update, uh, register that one. Let me just see where I had that. In start location and map. So start location and map. Right now it's only doing the user interface. We need to actually put the location set up in there. So I'm going to create a request here. Location request. Wow, that was really bad. That guy. Uh, no, actually it should be the location one. That guy there. Um, and we're going to, or is it the other one? Wait a minute. No, it is the other one. I hate it when you have the same name in two different packages. There we go. So we're going to create a re location request object. I'm going to use apply to initialize it. And we're going to set up the how often we want to check the, the location. We're going to prioritize high accuracy. So we're going to try to use whatever the best accuracy we can to return our location. I'm going to make my interval be five seconds and my fastest interval be zero seconds. And typically it's going to be a second or two in between these requests anyway. But we're basically saying here, I really don't need it any more often than five seconds. Uh, because you're going to park somewhere, you're probably going to be sitting there for a few seconds fiddling with the, the application and getting out. So within five seconds, once we know it, the button will be available and the user can hit it. Um, and then we're going to tell our location provider to use this request and go fetch the data for us. 
So fuse location provider client equals location services. And once again, you know, actually what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and do a file invalidate caches and restart. And let's see if this actually fixes it. And this will take about a minute because it needs to re-index. But hopefully that will uh, make it so this actually ends up being available. Because it should see that. It's, it's available. When I paste it in, it finds it just fine. So Android Studio tends to be a little buggy at times. I do miss Eclipse. I don't recall ever having this much trouble with Eclipse. Of course, that could just be rosy memory of mine. Who knows? And... Don't worry, that red's gonna go away. <laughs> This is the part that always scares me during an invalidate and restart. I'm like, ooh, did I break it? But once it's done with the build model here, it should understand all the things that are available. And, oh, even more to index, yay. Don't worry about this message right now. This is just saying that the plugin that we're using inside Android Studio is based on the 1.6 definition of uh, Kotlin and not the current one that we're trying to hit. And there we go. Okay, so now let's see what happens when I hit control space. There it is. So that actually was the problem, is it just needed to, to be, uh, the cache needed to be cleared. Ressa, fressa, ressa, fressa, ressa, ressa. So get fused uh, provider client and I need to pass in the activity. And there we go. So that'll get our client. That takes care of the contract with the late init. So now we've filled that guy in and now we can use it. And so I'm gonna say fused location provider client, request location updates, and I'm gonna pass in the location request, the location callback, and looper that get main looper. So this guy, the get looper to get main looper is saying, I want to get the results on the user interface thread. I could put that in a different one, but uh, that one works well. So what is he unhappy about here? So missing permissions required by fuse location pro provider, yada, yada, yada. The general lint check that's happening here is trying to make sure that inside this function, you're doing it in a way that you definitely had already requested the permissions. We've set it up so that no matter how you get here, we do have permissions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna alt enter on him and say suppress missing permission. Boom, and that should make him go away. So now he's nice and, cl and clean. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna use this request to schedule how often it wants to check the location. Whenever a, a response comes back, it's gonna go to that location callback, which we're using to just update the view model. And we're doing that update on the main looper. And I gotta look up uh, we can set that up for non-user interface, but it's a really quick thing, so it's not that big a deal. Um, okay, so that should set it up so that whenever we get locations, it goes to the user interface, it goes to the view model. Now we need to actually use that somewhere from the view model. So inside of here, we need to fill in the details for these guys. So what's the current location? What's the car current location? And what do we do when we ask to uh, set the car location or clear the car location? So to do this, um, right now, actually, looking at this, we have it actually displaying multiple cars in the, the view. Let's actually change that to be a single car again. And it's gonna be a nullable lat long. And it'll just be the car. And so down here, 
we just have a single state for it. And actually, I'm going to go up here and get rid of these guys so that... Uh, yeah, let's get rid of this so that they don't get in the way. So I want to make sure I don't miss where I need to make changes. Okay, so here, that's our map control. That's our top bar. Here's our guy here. Okay, good. So we're going to remember based on the car, let's create a marker state for the car location. And, oops, should be car. And then, well, that's nullable. So we should have a car question mark dot let it. Otherwise, it's just going to set car states to null. And I could rename that to car state. Okay, and let's see where car state is being used. So here he is. Instead of having to do this for each index, we just have a single one. So we're only going to display that one guy. So I'm going to say car state. And let's go ahead and make that be it. And I don't need that click. And we'll say car location. Uh, and the polyline, we don't need that for this example. So we'll remove that there. And that's a little nicer. What is unhappy down here? The on walk to car. Um, oh. I may want to change that. This is one of those times when, you know, the, the lint telling you that it's unused is super, super useful. So now back up in here, when we're calling this guy, instead of being car, it's just going to be a single car. And we'll fix him in a minute. And now we get to deal with all these fun things here. So we've got our view model. On set car location and on clear car location, we're just going to directly go to the view model there. So we're going to say view model colon set car location and this one will be view model clear car location and there's one more in here on walk to car <coughs> and we can get rid of that there i'm just going to make him be an empty lambda for the moment and now we got to get the current location and the car location here. So these are flows being exposed from our view model. So we need to actually get the values from those flows. So we can just come in here and say val current location. Equals view model dot current location, which is a flow dot collect as state and the initial is going to be null there we go and then we'll do the same kind of thing for the car lat lawn and we can just pass these in there current location and car lat lawn and those are probably not nullable no, they are nullable, but what's the deal? Oh, bye. There we go. So now we're good there. This will collect them, update the values when needed, and then it'll refresh this top bar as needed. So now down in here, this is going to be the car lat long being passed into there. And what do we miss up in this one? Oh, no parameter, no, nothing passed for content. Oh, I never finished that part. So we'll say content equals, and then we're going to move this stuff. Like that. And they added in a new check here, which I really like saying, hey, you know what? You didn't use the padding values. So I want to make sure that I say padding 
with what's passed in up there. And the reason for that is that when this scaffold does its work, he's trying to figure out how big your content area should be. And so he passes in these padding values to tell you how much space to reserve so that things don't overlap you. So that's a good check. I'm glad they added that lint check in. Today's the first time I've seen that. Okay, so now this guy here was gradually displaying those cars on the screen, so I don't actually need these anymore because that was just for that earlier demonstration. And then this guy is figuring out the lat long bounds. Again, we don't need that for this demonstration. You're gonna to need to do something like that for your assignment. So that goes away. Okay, so we have our position based on when it's available. We should see stuff on the screen and the remember location hopefully will work. Let's give it a try. Now, of course, I'm running this on an emulator, and the emulator does not actually have a GPS, but we can simulate that using uh, the settings for the, uh, the emulator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this little gear up here, and I'm going to say view mode. You can't really see it because it's outside the area, but I'm going to change view mode to window, which just pops it up in its own window here. And I'm going to use this little dot, dot, dot to bring up the extended controls. There they are. And the location part of the extended controls is where we're saying our GPS is. So we're basically pretending that's where the GPS is. Now notice when the app starts here, allow Compose Maps to access this device location, precise or approximate. So the user can choose either one of these settings to say if they want you know, precise, precise location or if they want kind of general location. And then the scope of when they want to do it. So they can just say don't allow, saying they don't want to allow this location at all only this time or while using the app. So I'm gonna hit don't allow. And now we're having that little dialogue come up that we said, and it says, we need the, the course or find location to locate your car. Um, please allow these permissions in the, this via the app info settings. So if I go to app info, this is the device app, inf app information. I can go to the permissions section and this is going to ask which permissions are, you can allow here. And notice that it, we asked for location and it's not allowed. I can click on it and then change it to be allow only while using app. And then whether or not I want a uh, precise location. Now, when I come out of here, it should take me back to the home screen because I had exited the application with that finish. So now if I restart, oh, which one is it? I'm not sure which one it is in here. So I'm going to restart it from Android Studio. There we go. So now here we are in the application. Let's see if we can figure out where we want the car to be. So if I hit the little star, it's gonna take advantage of where my current location is. So let's see where we want our current location to be. Um, so if I put a marker, where did it go? There we go, that's where I want to be. It's around here somewhere. <laughs> Where's that parking lot? Well, let's go ahead and go to the kite lot and a kite flying area. That sounds like fun. Let's click right there. It's showing us the location. I'm gonna say set location. So that's my current location. If I hit the star here, Notice how these other guys showed up because I now have something set. And if I zoom out a little bit here, I should see my car parked in the kite lot. Now let's say that I moved my current location. So maybe I was off flying kites and I'm gonna be over here. I'm gonna set that as my current location. If I wanted to, I could say move my car there. Let me go ahead and clear the car. And let's actually put ourselves back up in the kite lot again. and then save my car there, there he is. Let's go flying our kite over here somewhere. That's gonna be my current GPS location. And I'm gonna to walk to it. So I'm gonna hit the little walk icon here. And if we're lucky, oh, I didn't fill in the details on that. We have to fill in the details on that. 
But thankfully, our car will be remembered so that when I exit the application and come back in, it'll actually show that to me. I should clear some of these other ones that are in here. So let's go over to our application and take a look at that empty Lambda that I set up on the walk to car. So this one's calling walk to car. Let's see where he's called from. And there's that empty Lambda. So let me find the walk to car here. There we go. So what we want to do is first of all say you can only walk if you have a current location. And then based on that, we're going to go off to Google Maps and ask it to do the navigation for us. So I'm just going to copy that chunk. Paste them in there. And let's take a look at what this looks like. So what we're going to do is, first of all, if we have a current location, I'm going to keep track of that. We also have to have a, current, a car location. And hopefully we've set up the state right, so that's actually going to be OK. Um, current location could come and go, though. So if you don't have a current location, we'll say cannot navigate. There's no current location available. Um, if we don't have a car, cannot navigate. You didn't save a car anywhere. Um, but hopefully in that case, we shouldn't see the little walk icon even appear up there. And then what we're going to do is create a, a little URI here for going into Google Maps. So we use this URI passing in the origin, current latitude and current longitude, and the destination, latitude and longitude of the car, travel mode walking. And that's going to go off to Google, figure out the route that we're going to go to. Um, actually, I'm sorry. When we do start activity passing in that URI, it's going to go to Google Maps installed locally and open that guy up. If you don't have Google Maps installed locally, it should go to uh, whatever your browser is and pass that URI in. Um, one of the things that I don't really talk about in Android as much anymore is uh, using intents to keep track of where you can navigate between different applications. And one of the coolest things about this platform is that when you install an application, you can install something called an intent filter. And an intent filter gives you an action name and possibly some data. So in this case, the action name and this piece of data are provided. And your application can set up some patterns for those. And if you see certain actions and certain patterns of URIs or certain actions and then just URI by itself, your application is ready to be able to handle that. And what will happen by the system is the system, when we do this start activity, we're going to pass in this intent saying what we'd like to do, and then uh, it will try to match that against any installed applications. So if you have an application installed to be able to handle action view in a URI, ignore this for the moment. Um, if you had something in for viewing a URI, that application would be invoked. If you had multiple things set up to view that URI, it would give you a little dialogue to say, well, which one do you want to run? And you've probably seen this when you try to share something. You know, you get a, an a little dialogue popping up saying, well, where do you want to share it? Um, it's very, very similar to that. Now, this particular case, we did an extra apply, which sets a package. And this says, only let this application handle it. So in this case, it actually wouldn't go off to a browser because it's looking for the Google Maps application. And I believe doing this might end up sending you to the Play Store if it's not available. I'd have to check that. Uh, so this should make our navigation happen. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. And we will take a look here. So now we're in the application. Our car was saved, which is good. And so now if I hit the little walking guy, we go off to Google Maps, and it's plotting walking directions for us, saying how we can actually get back to my car. And then you can, you know, go ahead and use the uh, the preview or the the walk. I think it's probably saying preview because it's in an emulator here. Uh, but you can say, yeah, let's go, and then it'll walk you through the directions to get back to your car. So pretty nice. Ooh, the kite lot is busier than usual. That's pretty cool. They have people out there flying kites. I mean, I guess it's only a quarter after four right now, but um, yeah, it's, it kind of makes me wish I was working out there. Although I do like working from home. It's kind of nice. Okay, so that allows us to uh, uh, be able to navigate. And if I go back to my application, 
Let's hit my back button up here. Then I can clear it, drive my car back to where I'm going, and the next day whenever I park somebody somewhere, remember where I parked. Ta-da! Cool stuff. Any questions on any of that? Okay, so I am going to delete this key before I forget. <laughs> And I'm going to have to type the word delete here to make sure it gets deleted. And then let's take a quick look at, I'm going to show you the, um, the example in uh, uh, GitLab, but I'm going to tweak that before I actually assign it. So don't actually start working on it yet. I am going to take out the services part of it. Um, and I have to write up a little stuff to actually uh, you know, show you how to, to keep track of uh, sending off your service requests. Um, but just to kind of show you what this thing looks like that you're going to be doing. Oops, that's the gem matcher game. Let's not go there. There we go. So this one is going to be, can I zoom in on him? There we go. Uh, you're going to have a Google map set up around Washington, DC, and you're going to be querying, uh, making rest requests to get a hold of UFO information. So it's going to tell you where the UFO is and uh, uh, where it currently is. And then each request is going to show you different spots for the UFO. So if we take a look at, uh, let's see if this aliens one dot Jason. There we go. So this is it. They're actually just static pages on my website, but you're treating it like a rest API call. So the first request one dot Jason is going to say, I have ship number zero at this position. Then as time moves on, ship zero is now at this position. And then ship zero is here and oh, ship one just appeared now. And then we go to four, ship zero is moved, ship one is moved. We'll go to five, ship zero and one moved and ship two just came on the scene. And then we'll go to six and oh, look at UFO zero is no longer there. Now at this point, every time we get a change in location, you're gonna move the icon to show its current location and draw a line between all the previous points that that, uh, uh, the UFO was at. So he'll basically, he's basically leaving a little trail in the sky of where he's, uh, what message he's sending. When you get to the point when he's no longer in the list, you want to remove the icon from the screen, but keep the lines on the screen. And so that way you're going to see these messages appear, but the icon should be gone because the UFO is no, no longer available. Okay, so that's the gist of it. Uh, I'm going to be working tonight to rewrite it a little bit uh, because I definitely didn't have time to talk about services. Um, and I've been kind of leaning toward not having services in this assignment anyway, because it's really not that common that you're going to be writing services. It's it's much more if you want to share data between applications. Um, we will be talking about it and we'll be demonstrating things with it, uh, but I won't have you do an assignment on it. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, cool. Well, have a great night, everybody, and I will see you next week, and I will post when the assignment's up.